I remember one of the first times I realized that lying could get me what I wanted. I think I might have been four years old. And the rule in my house at that point in time was that I got only one bedtime story. Now, my mom had read me a story and tucked me in, and I knew that was it. I had to go to bed until my dad stopped in my room and asked me if my mom had read me a bedtime story yet. Hmm. Fortune favors the bold. And so I just went for it. I I told my dad that I never got a bedtime story and it worked. I I got another bedtime story and it was great until my mom walked into the room and asked my dad why I was getting another bedtime story. Let me tell you, I felt awful. I had messed up and I didn't know how to get back into my parents' good graces. What do we do when we've messed up? And maybe even more importantly, how should we think of God in those moments after we've messed up? The poet in Psalm 130 says this, If you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. The poet faced his own failure and look at how he thinks of God. God is perfect. God has the moral high ground to judge all of us. And yet in the poet's mind, God uses that high ground to lift us up through his mercy. With God, there is always forgiveness that we might learn to fear him. Perhaps this last week or year has been rough on you. Psalm 130 invites us to remember that in God, there is freedom. When you look back on your life, you will only and ever see that God's love has defined your story. That is the beautiful freedom of forgiveness. Turn to God and he will be faithful. It is in his heart to forgive. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in power that can break off every chain is power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name there's power in your name there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name There's power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love 
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Standing in your still a fan of some of those classic cartoons. Bugs Bunny, Tom and Jerry. I try and infect my kids, making sure that they, they grow up watching some of those classics. One of the best, to me, is Popeye the Sailor Man. He would always have that, that moment in the episode after enduring a bunch of pain and hardship where he would suddenly declare, that's all I can stand, I can't stand no more. And then he'd pop open a can of spinach 
and he would beat up Brutus, and then he would win his girl back, Olive Oil. And everything ended great in every episode. And Popeye could only endure so much trouble and so much pain and so much hardship before suddenly declaring, that's it, I've had enough. Well, maybe for some of you, as you've been going through this social distancing, as we've been going through this new normal, as we've been calling it, uh, maybe you've had about all you can stand, about all that you can endure. I think a lot of us feel like Popeye when it comes to social distancing. That's all I can stands, I can't stands no more. We're tired of being apart, tired of limiting the kind of contact we have with each other. We're tired uh, of being isolated. We have screen fatigue from so many Zoom meetings and so many contacts through email and other digital gadgets. We're a little bit tired and we feel a bit awkward in public settings because there's new social norms. I went out to, to shake someone's hand that I was meeting for the first time and they realized I'm not supposed to do that. And suddenly I didn't know what to do with my hands. I felt a lot like Ricky Bobby. We're sad about the loss of the many simple things that we typically enjoy throughout the summer. Parades and festivals and concerts and being able to travel easily. Suddenly, there's new restrictions that we all need to abide by. We've had to endure a lot in the past several weeks, and it seems like we'll have to continue enduring more. Despite everyone being fed up with social distancing, at the end of the day, all of us would be willing to endure a little bit more. All of us would be willing to do this a little bit longer if it meant that we're going to help somebody. If it means that we're going to keep somebody else safe and healthy amidst this growing pandemic that we're in. At its very core, this is what it looks like for us to love somebody. To choose their health above our personal inconvenience. To say that, that I care about your well-being. It's in that moment that we're choosing to love somebody. So all of us are willing to endure a little bit more if it means it helps somebody else. People are willing to endure more quarantine because of their genuine love for humanity. Love endures all things. Love gives us the ability to endure difficult situations. It allows us to persevere, to overcome hurt. It allows us to choose this path of forgiveness because we're willing to take on a little bit of struggle. Even social distancing during a pandemic is a chance for us to respond with love and compassion toward others. Yes, there are people who've gone rogue in observing the social distancing rules, but by and large, people are willing to step out for the sake of others. In a very real and practical way, you're living out your faith when you choose to, to be socially distant in certain situations or to wear a face mask or, or to wash your hands. These are all steps we can take to look out for each other's health. And if we're very honest... And enduring love is probably the hardest kind of love for any of us to practice. It's easy to love somebody once. It's easy to, to put somebody else's needs ahead of your own once in a while. But to do this in an ongoing way, to do this in a, in a, in a matter that, that says, I am going to continually uh, put the needs of others first is a difficult standard for us to hold. A love that's enduring requires so much sacrifice on, on our part that eventually we hit that Popeye moment where we just declare, that's all I can stands, I can't stands no more. It's like the adorable uh, cat in the video, right? It's a little kitten, it's playing with a puppy, and it's just kind of whacking at his, his face. It's cute for a little bit, but eventually the dog gets tired of it and decides to take a taste of the puppy, right? We all hit that breaking point at some, at some time. But Scripture reminds us that love is what sets us apart as believers. And in fact, as believers, that we should demonstrate an enduring kind of love. Let's pray as we unpack what it looks like for us to have an enduring love toward others. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the way that you challenge us. And Father, we thank you that you have loved us first with an enduring and steadfast love. Father, as we unpack your word this, this morning, we pray that you would open our minds and open our hearts. Uh, Lord, that you would teach us what it looks like to love others in this way. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, we're wrapping up this series that we've called All You Need Is Love. And when it comes to living out our faith, all you need is love. If you're going to get one thing right in your faith, it's, it's the ability to love others. God has demonstrated his love for us by sending his son 
to die on a cross to restore this broken relationship. The purpose of our faith is to bring God glory by the way that we live out our faith. And one of the best ways for us to live out our faith is to love others. God demonstrates this sacrificial love through his son. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for us to get our act together. God demonstrated his love for us long before we ever loved him. He makes the first move, choosing love in that moment while we were still sinners. And God sent his son knowing that, that we would sin even after coming to faith. God loved you knowing there was hate in your heart. He loved you knowing that in your life there would be moments where there was bitterness. He loved you knowing that, that you would probably even have moments where you held a grudge towards someone else. But God doesn't want us to stay that way. God wants us to grow in love as we begin to understand and wrestle with his love for us. Paul makes the proclamation in Romans 8 that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love for us. God's love for you is an enduring love. It's a steadfast love. First Chronicles 16.34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God's love for you is incorruptible. There's nothing you can do that would cause God to fall out of love with you. It's perfect. It's lasting. It's eternal. But God doesn't want us to stay in this state where we're not as loving toward others. He wants us to conform to the image of his son. God's love toward us changes the way in which we love others, challenging us to to demonstrate that same kind of enduring love to the people in our life. Enduring love overcomes and overrides our selfish impulses. I'm going to say that again. Enduring love overcomes and overrides our selfish impulses. As we come to terms with God's overwhelming, enduring love for us, we can't help but be overwhelmed to the point where we we allow that love to flow out of us towards someone else. Enduring love, it challenges us to love in ways that are uncomfortable to our flesh, but satisfying to our faith. There might be moments where where we don't want to love someone, but our faith directs us and guides us to step out in love. We're compelled by God's love to love others in this way, to to love in a way that that maybe doesn't look normal to the outside world, but we know to our faith makes perfect sense. The believer's enduring love is challenged most when we're called to love those that are most difficult for us to love in our life. And we all have people in our life like that. Hopefully you're not looking across the room at anybody like that in your life right now. Anybody can have an enduring love for chocolate, right? The only time you don't want chocolate is when you've had too much, but give it a few hours and you'll want more. Anybody can demonstrate an enduring love for puppies, right? They're cute, they're adorable, they pee on your floor, you're mad at them for about two seconds, and then they begin to like attack your feet and you're back to loving them again, right? Those are easy things to have enduring love for in our life. I need God's love in my life to love those who are difficult for me to love. It's God's love for a wretched sinner like me that allows me to then understand what it means to love those who are hard to love in my life. You see, enduring love surpasses our own prejudices. It surpasses our own biases. There is no room for God's perfect love and our personal prejudices in our life. We cannot be exclusive with our love while accepting God's radically inclusive love for us. God loves us to the point that he sent his son. We need to be able to demonstrate that same kind of love for others in our life. Events like the death of George Floyd shouldn't be happening in our culture anymore. Yet they continue to exist, which shows that there's still sin in this world. It's racism and it's ugly. Prejudice toward any person cannot exist alongside our faith. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and 11, it says, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in turn there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. 
The light exposes the darkness that we try to hide in our own heart. If we allow our heart to be consumed by God's love, then God's love will extinguish any hate that's there. But when we become blinded by the darkness, as John said, blind to our prejudices, blind to our own personal biases, then we have a love that is fleeting. We have a love that's conditional. God wants to transform the way that we love others. God's desire is that we would be a people who demonstrate an enduring love that overcomes our selfish desires and overcomes our selfish impulses. That our love would lead to acts of justice, giving a voice to the voiceless, being an advocate for those who are are the least of these. I want you to check out this video that does an amazing job of encapsulating what biblical justice looks like. If you were a praying mantis, it would be socially acceptable to devour your mate. And if you're a honey badger, you have no regard for other animals. You don't care. If you're a panda with twins, it's normal to abandon one to take care of the other. But if humans do any of these things, we would call it wrong, unfair, or unjust. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that, but we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like here, in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. And what do these words mean for the prophets, like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. 
But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them. The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Will you stand in the gap for others? Will you make other people's problems your problems? Will you make a difference even in just one life? Enduring love is demonstrated when we choose to forgive and love those that are hard for us to love. I need God's love to love others in this way. It's only when I start to come to terms with how much God really does love me that it changes the way I love others. Because I can't help but love others knowing how much God loves me and has forgiven me and, 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 and seems to love me despite all of the wrinkles and ripples that I have in my life. It's God's continual forgiveness for the stupid things that I do that compels me to demonstrate this same kind of love toward others. Enduring love presents opportunities to demonstrate patience and forgiveness in our faith and in our relationships. See, I can forgive someone in word, but this does not change my heart. I need, I need love in order to forgive them, to truly let them off the hook for what they've done. And when I let someone off the hook, it's not condoning what they did in my life, but it's saying, I'm going to let go of my right to hold that against you in some way. To demonstrate enduring love towards others means that we're willing to forgive them, that we would be bridge builders, that we would be reconcilers. We're able to do this when we come to terms with everything that God has forgiven us for. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We forgive others because God has forgiven us. This is the mark of the believer. I, I, I'm more patient. I'm more forgiving with others. I'm more loving to those who are difficult for me to love because of the way that God has loved me, because of the way that, that he has forgiven me. And it changes and transforms the way that we love others. Love endures all things. God demonstrates an enduring love toward each of us daily. We have the opportunity to respond to that love by demonstrating an enduring love toward others. Prayerfully allow God to reveal areas of your life where you've allowed personal prejudices or grudges to stand in the way of demonstrating this kind of love in your faith. Then, take steps towards healing and reconciliation. Let's pray. Almighty God, heal our hearts. 
Father, help us to understand the ways that we've fallen short of the grace you've shown us. Reveal the areas of our life where we've allowed grudges or prejudices to change and shape the way that we love others. Father, help us to love others the way that you love us. Give us hearts of compassion. Restore our hearts. Restore our community, Lord. Father, we thank you for the enduring love that you show us. May we learn to show that same kind of enduring love toward others. It's these things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Well, we're going to enter into a time of communion at this point. And one of God's greatest moments of enduring love is his demonstration and institution of the Lord's Supper. And if you would prepare your hearts at this time and prepare the elements as we receive those together. Matthew, it says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your tremendous example of love. Father, that you would, you would pour your life out in that way. Uh, Lord, that you would allow yourself to be broken and poured out for us. May we remember that it is an example set for us that we would live our lives broken and poured out as well. Father, we thank you so much for your son. We thank you for the grace you've shown us. We thank you for this time together. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Will you please stand up for the benediction? My benediction comes out of Romans 15. May you live in such harmony with one another, in one accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for joining us online. If you came ready with your gifts and offering, I want to remind you that you can always give online through our website at themissionchurch.us or you can mail your checks into the church. God bless and have a great Sunday.